Good afternoon. Welcome. Okay, we will uh, we will start uh, we will start shortly. Okay, is uh, is the team ready? Amit, Johan, Richard. Okay, let's start. Good afternoon all. Thank you very much for being present here. Today I have the pleasure to be with a great team of experts to introduce a highly technical topic. And at the same time, being relatively inexperienced myself in computer science, if you feel a little bit intimidated, fear not, because today we will adapt to beginners like me and maybe some of you. Let's start with the main topic of the day. What are these new technologies applied to ESG integration? Um, firstly, we will define natural language processing because this is a key component here, shall we? Dr. and Professor Jochen Ledner, will give us an overview and the foundations of this subfield of linguistics, computer science, and artificial intelligence. Jochen will be followed by Amit Das as an experienced practitioner to give us a bit more flavor into how to make textual data intelligent and how NLP is applicable in the context of financial investments and finally, with CEO of MarketSyc, Dr. Richard Peterson, we will discuss how media impacts and a few ESG specific use cases. The floor is yours, Johan, um, to give us a peek of recent trends from an academic perspective. Thank you very much, Julie. Hello and welcome everybody to this webinar. So my role here is really to introduce you to the question of what is NLP, natural language processing in the first place, and also a quick glimpse, what trends can we see as of this year in this exciting field? And you may ask uh, what entitles me to speak about these topics. Uh, and I should say my background is NLP, natural language processing, also known as computational linguistics. I've worked in various roles in industry and in academia uh, for the last uh, 24 years to build systems, applications, and study also the methods uh, and experiments of uh, natural language processing in various domains, um, including the financial domain. What is natural language processing or NLP? First of all, it is all about the understanding and sometimes generation of text by the machine. That means we will study concepts of the language realm, such as words, collocations, that is words that often are used together, phrases, trees that represent the grammatical structure of sentences, and also graphs and sentences themselves. Um, what, what are they? How can they be described? Uh, what can we do with them in applications? And finally, text documents made up of these uh, units. In linguistics, we speak of linguistic layers. So language can be studied at various levels of abstraction. Uh, one level is lexis, the inventory of words, Morphology is the study of the internal structure of these. Syntax is the grammar um, above the sentence, above the word level, excuse me. And semantics and pragmatics are about the meaning of the sentence uh, intrinsically and with uh, re relating to the application or intention. For example, if I say uh, the window is open, the literal meaning is that the window is open, but the pragmatic meaning is actually I'm cold. Can somebody please close the window? And uh, these non-literal uh, meanings 
uh, and a phenomena of ambiguity and the scope, i.e. what does something refer to, are extremely important if we want to understand language. Uh, and there are a number of ancillary tasks in LLP if we want to understand text, for example, in an ESG application. We need to split a text into words that's often called tokenization. We may want to split a text into sentences, sentence splitting. That's not actually as easy as it sounds because not every full stop is a full stop. There are, uh, there are dots that end abbreviations instead. And for the computer, this is actually a very hard task uh, in contrast to human beings. Uh, the question of a language identification, i.e. in what language is a text written in? Is it Chinese, is it English, or is it French? Abbreviation detection, abbreviation expansion, disambiguation. For example, DR can stand for drive or doctor, depending on context. If I say sunset DR dot, then it's probably sunset drive. But if I say DR Smith, it's probably Dr. Smith. Uh, so all these uh, phenomena can introduce noise if you get these things wrong. And co-reference resolution finally is about uh, the resolution of noun phrases um, also other um, linguistic elements that refer to things like pronoun, he, she, or it, what does it actually refer to earlier in the text? So if we cannot conduct these tasks or we make an error, then our linguistic understanding of a document is incomplete or even misleading. Once we can master all these layers and concepts, we can build applications such as machine translation, question answering, document summarization, information extraction, and the latter is actually uh, a super field that has different subfields like named entity tagging, finding out uh, the person names, organization names, locations, uh, time and money amounts and things like that in documents, Relation extraction, which is a higher level task that combines already extracted named entities to relations between them. For example, the binary relation uh, of, of somebody being a CEO of some institution, which is a very important relation for the financial realm. Or event extraction, let's say an acquisition got completed. That is an example of something that has a time, a place, an acquirer and an acquire, acquisition target or acquiree. And entity resolution. So if I say apple, do I refer to the literal apple, the fruit, or to one of the two apple companies, uh, the music company or the uh, IT company? And as you can imagine, confusing these leads to bad financial decisions, for example, in automatic trading. Now, now you know a little bit about what NLP is. Of course, this is really subject to large textbooks that we cannot cover here in 15 minutes, but you've seen some of the things that matter and some of the uh, constituent parts and tasks. Now, if we have components, software components and models that can master these tasks, then we can build financial applications from these building blocks. Some examples include information extraction from SEC filings, earnings call summarization, and by the way, the number in parentheses include years in which I worked on these topics personally, question answering for deals and macroeconomic indicators, sentiment analysis from con consumer interviews, and we will hear uh, more about that later from Richard, trading signals for alpha extraction, automatic extraction of risks from text documents, or information extraction of M&A events or CEO changes from the news. And more than one of these can actually be used because we want to learn about ESG, as you can imagine. And now we come to the question of trends. What actually happened in the last couple of years? So there is really the prelude, uh, one might say, the years uh, 2013, to 2017 and 19, respectively, uh, was when so-called uh, em word embeddings uh, in the context of deep learning changed everything. It is fair to say that a paradigm shift 
happened in 2013 and neural networks and in particular deep neural networks uh, became the uh, prominent paradigm in machine learning. A deep neural network is very simply a, a neural network with more than one hidden layer. That's the definition. A hidden layer is a, a level of the neural network that is neither input nor output. You might call it an internal uh, level. So anything that's got more than one of these internally is a deep net. And uh, a, a, re a revolution that was particularly important for NLP happened uh, 2017 to 19, uh, when transformers and a particular model called BERT, uh, presented by Google Research, uh, made it possible to solve many NLP problems much better than before. And this has had repercussions uh, beyond NLP uh, in the areas of search and even image recognition, uh, automatic caption description, and so on and so forth. And I think if we want to characterize the present time, we can say 2020 to 2022, there has been what may be called a Muppet explosion. Um, you can see that uh, machine learning people have a sense of humor. There has been a trend of naming many models after uh, Muppet show characters. So there's a bird model, but there's also Ernie and so on. Um, the trend is also that these models got bigger and bigger. They often had millions and then billions and then tens or hundreds of billions of parameters, uh, which demanded uh, increasing uh, hardware resources uh, to process these models, to train them and to evaluate them. And uh, there is a question of energy requirements uh, attached, especially in an ESG context, uh, uh, no pun intended. Now, since 2018, uh, I would say uh, models got bigger and bigger, but then there, uh, in parallel, research has been started on so-called distillation, making these huge neural networks smaller again, because people realized it's actually problematic uh, to uh, waste uh, perhaps $50,000 in uh, cloud uh, money on training a massive uh, model. And the associated energy uh, also goes along with certain CO2 emissions that have been critically discussed um, in the scientific literature, and rightly so. And people have also started looking into explainable AI or XAI for short, uh, because there is a problem with these uh, black box models, uh, neural networks do not really tell you why a certain decision was reached. And this is really going a little bit against business requirements. In business, we really prefer to know why a decision has been taken. And there may be a legal obligation to provide that, for example, under GDPR legislation. And finally, uh, ethics concerns. Uh, in particular, questions about inclusion um, and bias uh, and fairness, uh, because the training data that these models are trained with uh, determines the, the behavior of the model later. So any bias in the training data has massive repercussions and kind of conserves uh, society's biases uh, in that data and the model will behave accordingly. Now, in finance, uh, in particular, applications of these uh, big neural networks uh, have been uh, tried out on SEC filings, on earnings calls, and in the ESG space, uh, notably uh, by, by a team that I've been running, uh, Nugent et al. Uh, 2021 uh, is a paper, and you can contact me and I can provide you a copy if you want. And in the future, I think uh, there may be a trend back to slightly nimbler models, models that have uh, only tiny losses of accuracy, but may be much, much smaller and not be so demanding with respect to the energy required, uh, and also the number of parameters to be trained. You may call these greener methods um, and also hybrids between neural networks and rule-based systems to, to increase the explainability, so to make it possible to reconstruct why a particular uh, decision was taken by the system. And we don't really have a lot of time to go into details here. However, I wanted to show you at least something concrete. So here is a slide that shows uh, the improvement we achieved 
in this uh, paper from 2021 that uh, we used to, uh, using the uh, refinitive uh, model, uh, which is a bird model based on uh, RNA, the Reuters news archive available from refinitive. And we applied these uh, to classify controversies into different subclasses. Obviously, classification um, is an important task. For example, in the ESG domain, we want to distinguish ESG-related controversies from any other event or non-event document that we are not interested in to filter out, let's say, scandals, um, reports about business uh, ethics violations, or a tax fraud, uh, or any ESG-related topic um, of any kind. So you can see that a base model here, and the first one identifying, uh, let's say, a business uh, ethics violation uh, achieves a 65% accuracy, whereas uh, the better model trade trained on uh, RNA and using BERT as the new technology uh, achieves the 5% improvement, but in some other cases, these improvements are really much more vast. For example, the accounting category goes up from 8% to 29% accuracy, uh, 29 accuracy. And that is really something that is quite remarkable. And in the past, we have seen smaller incremental um, trends up, and there's usually diminishing returns. So as, as you try more and more techniques, you get smaller and smaller improvements, and eventually it's not worth continuing to work on a topic and uh, people move on towards a, another task. But with uh, deep learning models like BERT, we have seen a disruptive uh, step change. So it's exciting to be in that field and to be in that field right now, because just when people thought uh, standard techniques will no longer uh, create a revolution, a step change. Uh, we have such a step change again, and it isn't the first time. Every couple of year, years, something like that happens. So to summarize and to conclude, we have seen what NLP is really in a nutshell. Um, there wasn't enough time to go into any detail. Um, and if you want to get uh, some references from me, feel free to get in touch. I can recommend you textbooks or online courses that you can pursue. We've also discussed some NLP applications to finance, and uh, we have concluded with some expected trends. So in sum summary, it's a great time to be in the field of NLP. And we really say thanks to machine learning um, that has given us these advances. And uh, feel free to stay in touch uh, here's my email address. You can also follow me on Twitter, and uh, I would love to hear from your use cases. And if you need any any references, I'm happy to help you out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jochen. Next, we will now articulate from an academic uh, point of view to a practitioner view with Amit Das, Director Proposition Manager for News at Refinitive. Amit. Uh, thank you, uh, Julia, and thank you, Johan, and uh, very good evening to everyone. Uh, good to be on this webinar uh, as introduction. I head up the news feed product at Refinitiv, and I work with a lot of customers who are doing NLP or data science, and they want to utilize the textual data that we provide to drive the financial outcomes. Uh, as Johan mentioned, this is an exciting time and uh, mainly because uh, there is a lot of value here. Now, if, if the first thing that is needed for machine learning or data science or NLP is data, lots of them, right? Uh, and so people start looking at what are the data that is out there. And uh, the first instinct is to go for structured data uh, because that is easy to work with in terms of putting it into a database and working on it. But as you can see, more than 80% of the world data is unstructured. And as people or uh, firms look at structured data, the incremental value that can be got is kind of getting maxed out. And so firms are looking more and more towards unstructured data, the textual data that is available, uh, and which is growing. It it's constitutes about 80% of the world's data today. 
uh, but it's growing at about 42% year on year, while structured data is growing at about 22%. So over a lot of time, you would see that there is so much more text that will be generated, that will be utilized in terms of getting value in models. And that's mainly because text is the only medium, not the only, but the main medium where human beings communicate, complex ideas that you cannot always put together in numbers and that will continue uh, for, for a while. So let's look at what kind of data is needed. Uh, now, depending on the analysis to be done, uh, you want to ensure that you have the right content coverage. You have the breadth and the depth of the content that you're looking at, right? So, so if you're very specific to something, you really want to ensure that you have enough data and also going back into the history. And, and the second part of it, the more important part, it is financially relevant, right? There's a lot of data out there uh, that will be like messages, emails that may or may not always have financial re relevance. So you really want to kind of like go look at how relevant it is to the financial outcome that you're looking for and how do you find that piece of information, identify that piece of information and include it in the project. The second part of this is you want to get as much point in time historical data as possible. And there are two parts to this. One is the point in time nature of it. Uh, you re we really want to get data that has been recorded with the correct timestamp of when that information was released, mainly because you want to correlate it with changes that happened, the impact that happened in the market. Did a news release or a press release out there make a certain impact to the uh, market um, value of a company uh, as perceived in the market? That's something that you really want to kind of correlate to, right? Uh, and it sh should not change because you really want to keep the data as it was at that point of time. The second part is historical. And we have a lot of different business cycles, economic cycles that the market goes through. So we have had a good run up of technology stocks for the last decade. Uh, and the world is now swinging back towards value stocks. So also we have high inflation. So building models, we really need information in the past when such economic events happened. It, it, when the last recession was happening, when the last time technology stocks took a dip and uh, things moved towards value stocks, what were the kind of changes and how it impacted different asset classes, right? So you really want a long history so that you have all those kind of cycles uh, in the economy and the business, in the company that you really want to uh, gather. The last bit on this I would want to point out is that you really need to also make sure that none of the data that was historically uh, produced or sent out is lost. Uh, as in like, we do not look at only existing companies. There are a lot of companies which die out over time. And if we look at only data for existing companies, then you will have something called a survival bias. Only the companies that are successful get looked up in the model. Uh, and the risks that, a, that really killed a company or a killed a specific market out there is never reflected. So you really want to retain everything out there as historically point in time as possible. This, the third part is also very important is that we have a lot of text and text communicates ideas. Now, in many cases, depending on the source of the text, it might have biases based in it. So somebody ha might have a strong opinion one way or the other. So you really want to get unbiased source of data that is dependable. So it's, you really want to go for something that is a credible source like uh, Reuters. Uh, thus, as Johan was talking about, the study was done using Reuters news. And there was mainly one of the key reasons customers come to us is because of the unbiased, factually validated uh, data that Reuters produces. 
The last part is an obvious one. It's about, uh, you want to ensure that you have no legal issues for using the data. Now, you have a lot of data, uh, but then it becomes, uh, how do you work with all this data? On average, and I'm going to talk to this from a context of news, uh, because that's where it will come alive more uh, simpler. When you look at news, we create about 35,000 stories on a daily basis. And that's a lot of news covering, a uh, lot of uh, asset classes, regions, companies, commodities, currencies, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the news that is produced by Refinitiv can become a huge amount of piece of information uh, where a lot of it might not be relevant. So you really want the data to be indexed so that the right set of data or right set of news articles is easily discovered. The first one is obviously you can, it needs to be tagged with the right entities, the companies, the commodities, the, the currencies and so on and so forth. So that based on what the project is interested in, you can filter out everything else, which might be nice, right? The second part is concept or topic tagging. A news article can be about a commodity, can be about a specific region, can be about a specific uh, um, political person. So it really has to have all the tagging that really identifies what is this news about. And that aboutness of the news is very important so that in the project or in the, as the machines look at uh, doing NLP and data science, uh, they can kind of figure out which news articles are really useful or which textual articles are really useful that they can utilize. There are a lot of tools out there to do tagging. Uh, and we have, I mean, Refinitiv has uh, the textual data uh, tagging called intelligent tagging. What it does is takes in all this textual data, extracts, classifies, and tag based on the text that is there for each one of them. It can identify what are the companies this text is talking about? Uh, what are the people that they're talking about? And what are the potential relationships between the companies and the people, the directors and so on and so forth that this uh, text is about, right? Uh, and that kind of transforms uh, or extracts this into a structured metadata that someone can kind of like query and say, okay, I want to look, look at specific companies or that I'm interested in. It also creates a lot of topic codes uh, and the Refinitiv News has over 6,000 topic codes across different uh, categories. Uh, it can be about equities and so on and so forth. So people can kind of look at, okay, I want to look at energy markets. Give me all news related to energy markets. Or somebody might be more interested in just looking at crude oil rather than natural gas or renewable uh, energy. Uh, or someone else might be looking at, just give me text about US crudes. So the ability to go down and, and, and this uh, topic code tagging, you have multiple structured data across that you can go down granular into more detail on a specific topic or come up to a more general level um, industry or topic that you want to look at. But what this really helps in is to kind of filter out the noise and discover what is a relevant news story or a textual article that you want to look at. Now, other than doing the indexing part, there are other uh, analytics or derived analytics from the text that can help narrow down and identify the needles in the haystack. One is the relevance. So how relevant is this news article to the specific um, story or the, to the specific company that you're looking at? 
uh, right? So in a story, Facebook might be mentioned at the very bottom and in passing. Uh, and you really want to kind of ensure that the that you can identify that it is not really relevant. This story is not really relevant about Facebook. And so if you are looking for Facebook related information, you want to focus on stories that are highly relevant about Facebook. You want to look at, is this unique information in the story? Uh, now you have a, a journalist a look at a evolving story. They write a first version of the news article, and then they will have multiple different versions of the story coming out as the story evolves. Uh, so you really want to kind of have a way of deduping across all these iterations of the story, but also to find out if across the different stories that have been broken by the different news vendors, be it Reuters, PR Newswire, or Globe Newswire, other different sources of data. Is this unique information that is new to the market? Or is this a old information that has just been regurgitated or reiterated, right? Lastly, I mean, I have a category out here for analytics. There is a lot of analytics out there other than relevance and uniqueness or novelty. You have things such as sentiment, what uh, you can figure out, like what was the author's tone around it? Uh, what was the sentiment around a specific company or a commodity? Uh, you can look, I try to identify trends and uh, like how much of uh, interest is garnered over uh, crypto, given that all that is happening in the world right now about, around crypto, right? Is there something that is evolving that you want to kind of understand? Uh, that has garnered a lot of interest uh, amongst the, the, the financial world. Now, we can, I mean, we do provide a lot of this analytics uh, within Refinitiv, but I think there is a lot of uh, tools also outside of Refinitiv that is available that you can leverage. Now, the, the main part to look there is to make sure uh, as Johan was talking about, uh, that it is really financially applicable. And you can really explain that the explainability part is there, that it goes down and creates that analytics, the NLP that uh, you can uh, build upon, uh, as well as help generate the explainability later on by, if you have to validate uh, to say, this is why the um, the model recommended a specific outcome. Uh, so here is a uh, example. I think Johan mentioned this uh, example about uh, the window is open. Now you can take that text. I can run it through a speech recognition uh, called more of a ba bag of words to see what is the kind of words that are there and try to get sense out of it. You can look at it from a syntax or the grammar of it or the semantics, uh, like what does it really mean, right? So uh, another example other than the window being open is I'm fine, which is a positive sentence versus I got a fine. Just looking at bag of words may not always give you the outcome, the real meaning of what this really uh, means or what the customer, the author intended, right? So we really need to want to look at the context of it, the semantics of it, and doing the NLP, you don't want to go into identifying what are the negative words, what are the positive words, and each word, what is it acting upon? And as that meant, um, meaning of that, for this example, the opportunities are related to General Motors. Is this a positive thing? Is this really meaning on General Motors, or is this talking about Tesla? and then bring out all the contextual meaning out of this uh, text from an NLP perspective. Now, I spoke about news, but there is a ton of other text sources. You have transcripts, you have broker research, you have filings, uh, and all of them really provide differential value in many ways. They are 
sometimes orthogonal and can add value, different value. And if you look at the text out there, the amount of text and the coverage uh, is different. And so uh, the best ways of doing uh, data science is to look across different sources of textual data, be it different sources of news, different research, filings, transcript, and try to find out what are the trends, what are the insights that we can get from doing that NLP. So here we can look at news, transcripts, filing, broker research, and obviously uh, Refinitiv provides the, and Refinitiv is the only one who can provide a Reuters news as a feed. You can build upon an entity or concept tagging uh, on your own end as you're doing the data science, or you can leverage what comes out from the pipe that is already uh, built up. But whatever you choose, I think it's important to make sure that it is well tagged and you have the ability to granularly figure out what is noise and what is usable. Uh, and then many customers choose to create their own derived analytics or take uh, the pre built pre-derived analytics that we provide, such as the news analytics or market sec analytics. And what that is valuable is that you do not have to go through, do all the groundwork of NLP and machine learning on your end, but can get the insights from this analytics to go uh, help drive um, more of your models. With this, I will hand it over to Richard, Dr. Richard Peterson, who can walk you through more around how market psych analytics is utilized in the context of finance. Great, thank you, Ahmed. Are you able to see my screen? I am. Okay, excellent. So based on the Johan's and Ahmed's talks about first natural language processing and then how we use natural language processing with text, I will be showing you examples in financial markets of how we actually deploy these to predict uh, asset prices. Here's a quick visualization for the last 24 years of the US stock market. The blue line here is the Russell 1000 index. So the top 1000 stocks in the United States and these candlesticks and this two lines here are moving averages of sentiment in the media expressed about stocks in the United States. So you can see in 1998, 1999, there's generally positive sentiment, uh, but one of these averages is 200 day average and one is 500 day average. When the 200 day average is below the 500 day average, that means that media is becoming more negative. And we put red shading here. And you can see how the sentiment was falling during the dot-com bust in 1999, it then started rising, but then due to the 2001 terrorist attacks in the United States, it started to fall again. We can also see this during the financial crisis and then the recovery from the financial crisis. And then more recently, we can see how sentiment has been falling in the US stock market following the peak in 2021. So this type of data shows us there is a correlation between media sentiment about stocks and the actual price movement. But the real question is, does it predict? And how do we find the predictive models here? This video is another depiction for the last, each month for the last three years since the beginning of 2020, we look at the size of the bubble is the amount of chatter about each company the amount of conversation. You can see GameStop and AMC during the uh, meme stock frenzy. You can see Gazprom, uh, which fell to the bottom uh, due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You can see how Tesla rose and become the most talked about company. And here's GameStop and AMC again over the years. So there's a lot happening with sentiment. Companies are moving in and out. Sometimes they are receiving a lot of attention, sometimes no attention. So how do we make use of this? So that's what we'll be discussing for the next few minutes. Now, there are two philosophies in academia 
for how to find value in investor sentiment. One idea is the idea of trend following. And this comes back to the first book written on a stock market, which was by Josef de la Vega in Amsterdam in 1688. And his book was called Confusion de las Confusiones. And it described a conversation between a merchant, like a business person, who wanted to become a day trader. So he's discussing investing with a shareholder. And he asks, what can I do? What is the most prudent action? And the shareholder says, go in the direction of the waves and don't fight against the currents. So essentially, he should follow the trend. Now, the, the reality in many aspects of sentiment data is that when the media makes a pronouncement or when the media has a opinion, that opinion often becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. That is, the opinion spreads and people begin to believe the opinion and it changes their behavior. This is one example we have where we measure the references to economic growth in the United States. And this is from 1968 onwards. The pink line here is a recession. The blue line is whether people are explaining that the economy is expanding or contracting. So is the economy growing or shrinking? When people start to say that it's shrinking down to a one standard deviation below the usual level of conversation, there always is a recession. So, but first, people start talking about the economy slowing, and then the recession begins. So in some ways, recessions are a self-fulfilling prophecy. People begin to become worried about a recession, and business people stop hiring, maybe lay off some employees, start saving some cash, stop borrowing, and that creates the recession. And we can see now, since May of this year, we have seen our economic indicator below one standard deviation. And so we imagine there will be a recession soon in the United States. So again, this type of data can sometimes create the reality of the marketplace. Now, the most common finding with sentiment data is that when companies are described positively in the media, their share prices tend to outperform. So this is a study in the United States over on the left. Uh, the same study was done here in Europe and in Asia. And what it shows is that when we rank companies based on the past one month of media sentiment. So for example, uh, we find how, when we say po uh, sentiment, we mean how positive versus how negative is the media about that company. So when we take the 10% of companies with the most positive description in the social media and news media, that's what we see here in this green line if we track forward their performance in the stock market. When you take the 10% with the most negative views, those that have the, you know, the most thumbs down comments, we see that those companies have the most negative returns. And this is groupings of over 300 companies in each of these lines. And they're averaged over 14 to 15 years here. So we can see that this is a generally a, quite a consistent pattern, and it's quite strong in Europe as well as the United States, and it's also quite strong in Asia. So this finding that the media tends to predict stock prices is quite consistent. Uh, we did write a white paper on this, and we've also seen that uh, when we use a Granger causality analysis, that media sentiment predicts price momentum, but price momentum does not predict media sentiment. So the media seems to cause price momentum. Now, of course, the media is often reporting on real events at the company, so, but the media is the first place to find where is the direction of future stock prices. Uh, many investors, of course, you, many of you will use price momentum in strategies, but in fact, the price momentum factor is again predicted by media sentiment itself. Uh, we also see this effect not only in stocks, but in commodities and currencies and country level indexes. We see it uh, all over in every tradable asset that when the sentiment begins to improve, 
the price tends to rise. This is a study from an academic in commodities. And as he says here in the bottom, past sentiment has a positive impact on current returns. So that is the general idea. And that is what Joseph de la Vega said. We should follow the direction of the opinions. But wait a minute, there's another opinion here. There's another perspective that is different. Warren Buffett, Benjamin Graham, value investors, which you at the CFA are very familiar with, they often say that we should buy from Mr. Market when he is pessimistic. Or as Warren Buffett has said, we should be greedy when others are fearful. The first reference that I can find to this is from Munihisa Honma in 1755. He was a Japanese rice arbitrageur and was considered at his lifetime to be the, one of the wealthiest people in the world or, or the wealthiest. And he said, when all are bearish, there is cause for prices to rise. So how do we reconcile those two effects? On the one hand, Joseph de, de la Vega says that we should follow the trend. And the data that I showed you also shows that we should follow the trend. But on the other hand, many of the wealthiest people in history, including Warren Buffett, have said we should buy when others are afraid. When prices dip, then we should buy before they rise again. So what, there's some researchers that have looked at this contradiction, and they find that when there's a lot of emotion associated with a fall in prices, then it's more likely to rise. And that gives us an opportunity. So for example, at the weekend of October 1st and 2nd this year, just two months ago, Credit Suisse, Suisse had a very high level of uncertainty, which is the color here, as well as a lot of conversation about it over the weekend, more than any other stock in the financial sector about 10,000 references per day in news and social media, because there was a short attack on Credit Suisse from Reddit, the uh, Wall Street Bets uh, site, where previously they had been attacking shorts. Now, uh, people on Reddit were organizing to create a short attack on Credit Suisse. So sometimes you can detect this type of activity in the media uh, before it happens. However, Credit Suisse's stock price rose in the next month or two after this attack. So it actually outperformed the stock market after the attack. So again, this is the idea of buy on fear. When everyone was worried that Credit Suisse would collapse, the share price actually rose subsequently. So there are periods of time and specific events that you, we will see the price drop and then rise in a V shape. But for most of the time, for thousands of stocks, when it's not a dramatic, uh, very highly uh, attended to event. Most of the time, then stocks will just drift in the direction. But a few specific times that are very dramatic, there will be a V-shaped pattern. We also see this uh, quite commonly in currencies. In this strategy, we, buy, we borrow from countries with low interest rates, and we invest into countries' currencies with a lot of, where there's a lot of fear Instead of buying into the countries where there's high interest rates, we buy into the countries where there's fear, which fear is risk perception. And when we do this month after month, we get a much higher return than we would from the carry trade. The carry trade, of course, has been doing very well for the last 20 plus years. But if we use fear instead of high interest rates, we actually get a higher return. So sometimes fear is measured as risk perception. And we can pull that out of social media and news commentary, how much fear people are experiencing. So I'll turn my attention now to ESG data. Uh, we recently won an award, fortunately, for the best ESG sentiment data. So what I'll be describing is ESG data not derived from company reports or press releases about the company, but rather this data is derived from reading the news and the social media commentary about the company by uh, third parties, such as NGOs and objective observers. Now, one of the ESG themes that seems to be most impactful is environmental investment. So when we look at the top 3,000 companies in the United States since 2006, and each month we rank them by the percentage of conversation that talks about their clean technology investments or green investments or their land conservation 
activities, all of those are considered environmental investments. And when we look at their share prices over time, we find that that portfolio has a much higher return, those companies involved in environmental activities. And of course, Tesla is here, but this is a portfolio of 300 stocks. So Tesla only contributes a few percentage to this return. We see many others like financials, like MSCI or utility companies, which are many of these other companies here in the top. So even boring utility companies, when they start to clean up their activities, had much higher share returns. Now, another, um, since you, know, you are the CFA Society and you pay much attention to accounting, um, accounting is also considered an ESG factor in that um, governance determines how well a company attend, attends to its accounting regulations. So this is a depiction of Wirecard's share price here in the bottom of the screen. We can see that when the Financial Times doubts their accounting practices in their first article revealing that, the share price was hit a little bit. Um, and there was a lot of chatter in subsequent days. And eventually, the share price started to recover somewhat. There was a few more articles. Finally, the company itself admitted that it had a large hole in its balance sheet and the share price collapsed. But there were warnings from the Financial Times article and many other rumors. Even before the Financial Times article, there were rumors that there was a problem. And so this is the type of thing that can be detected in media sentiment data. We can find risk before it impacts the portfolio by looking at what people are saying. And we can find not only these companies that are the highest with the best invest, you know, environmental record, for example, but also those companies that have the most concerns about their accounting or governance. And we can measure quantitatively which of these have the most impact on the future returns. So here's a quantitative study using an index we produce called accounting controversy. So if a company has uh, doubts about its accounting practices or uh, concerns about its accounting, we call that an accounting controversy. And these companies are S&P 500 companies, so the top 500 in, in the United States. Month after month, we look at those that have the top 10% uh, of controversial references to their accounting versus all of the other companies. And we see that over time, the controversial companies in this red line significantly underperform the overall S&P 500. So as a risk management tool, ESG can also be very valuable to help us understand where there is poor governance, for example. I also chose this example because it is industry agnostic. So a lot of criticisms of ESG say that high ESG companies are generally companies in the electricity economy or renewable energy, which have, of course, been performing very well. But in this case, every company has accounting and accounting controversies affect everyone. We also have uh, data that is controlled by industry, and we find that we still get outperformance for high ESG scoring companies. So we have on this data over 100 academic papers and clients in over 25 countries. We produce several products here uh, based on media sentiment data. We even have a predictive model for stocks that we built using media sentiment. And we have found that just like I showed with the rainbow chart, that sentiment does lead to outperformance, but there are many factor uh, subsets of sentiment that also enhance performance and add stability. So we've been launching that with uh, the Starmine team at Refinitiv. In any case, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at uh, richard at marketpsychdata.com and um, Julie as well will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, thank you very much. Let's wrap up. So now that thanks to our experts, we are all more familiar with how natural language processing and artificial intelligence applied to textual data can be transformed into highly valuable metadata or into a buying signal or even in certain cases into alpha. I think we understand the possible applications of these concepts into the financial investment sector. Now that we have also reviewed media sentiment and a few ESG use cases with Richard from Market Psych Analytics, 
Um, I think we understand its uh, practical approach and possible implications to ESG integration into portfolio management now and in the future. Now it's time to cover the questions you may have and, um, and, uh, yeah, and, um, and see if we can uh, pick up a few questions uh, in the remaining time. We have five minutes. Um, do we have questions in the chat? I think we don't have the questions. Um, okay, well, I think I will free uh, everyone up um, a few minutes uh, before um, the Zoom um, is going to stop in that case. Anyone wants to raise their hands or for a question? Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone who attended tonight and uh, sorry, this evening and um, to uh, all our speakers. Thanks very much. Oh, I have a question. Sorry. Oh, no, it's not a question. It's many thanks for, for this webinar. Uh, thank you, Olivier, for your comments. And um, thanks everyone who attended. Have a, all a very good uh, evening. And um, Oh, sorry, last question. <laughs> so to the very last minute, um, which textual data set is mostly used by researchers or investors? Who would like to uh, take this question? Uh, um, I can start and I'm sure Johan and Richard would have more to add to this. Uh, I mean, we did a survey um, sometime last year, in fact, or early this year. Uh, and to find out what are the things that in the practitioner world in the firms, what are the companies, uh, what uh, are the textual uh, data that people start with or look at? 67% uh, start with news, uh, practically because there is a huge volume and there's the journalist input out there uh, and it's easy to get to. Uh, but there is, as more and more data sets are becoming available, I think there is a lot of other textual data sources that are also being utilized. Uh, Johan, Richard, anything you want to add? Yes, uh, I would say you're quite right. News is the first thing that comes to mind. Hmm. Secondly, uh, company reports and uh, transcripts of earnings calls, uh, SEC filings of public companies uh, and uh, brokerage reports, uh, increasingly social media, although there was at least one fund that said they would only trade based on Twitter and they subsequently had to change their approach. Uh, so it's not quite clear how much social media can contribute and in what form to embed it. But of course, we all know there are studies about that, that uh, some news break on social media first. And uh, of course, everybody is now curious what happens to, for example, Twitter, uh, with a new ownership model. Thank you. Um, one last question, because we have uh, literally two minutes. What NLP machine learning tools are commonly used for finding alpha or in into risk management? Uh, who would like to take this question? I, I can take it uh, just just briefly. So. I mean, the tools are uh, many, the tools are many, and depending on what you want to do with it, you may have a preference. Uh, so what I can say, though, that uh, two uh, tools uh, get commonly mentioned recently in the experimental stage. So when people uh, build models that they just use to explore for backtesting, and those are PyTorch and TensorFlow, I would say. Uh, this doesn't mean that you can't use anything else. In fact, you may uh, be in the high frequency trading arena, and then you may have some homegrown tool that uh, optimizes performance uh, to reduce latency. Um, and, and those people, they, they tend to write their own tools and leaving out all the error checks and uh, shortening their cables to squeeze out every nanosecond. Uh, 
Um, but that depends very much on your trading strategy, I would say. But uh, some some people try more longer term uh, strategies where uh, speed is not of the essence, then they may use R, which has uh, an abundance of statistical model types. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, there are a few more questions uh, in the chat, but maybe uh, I think we will maybe address them um, in, in the chat because we have to wrap up. Um, so thanks very much uh, for your participation. Have all a very good evening. Thank you and um, see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, bye-bye.